What's going on, guys, and welcome to my EW Collision audio review for July 29th, 2023. I am Graham G. S. Matthews. Hope you guys are doing well and having a great weekend so far. Also, an onset report from the show in Hartford last night that I was able to attend. My first collision taping, obviously, they just started the show last month. This is like their, I don't know, seventh episode, so my first collision show. And it was a very fun time. This ended up being a very good show. I didn't have high hopes going in. Just looking at the lineup, it felt like a bloated lineup with like a lot of random matches, uh, the Punk appearance wasn't advertised until like earlier in the day. They added the Samoa Joe versus Gravity match. Fucking random. Kira Hogan versus Mercedes Martinez. Fucking random. They announced a six-man tag team match last week on the show with Bullet Club Gold and El Ijo Del Vikingo, Action and Dreddy, Darius Martin. Looked like a good match on, on paper. And not exactly random because Jay White and Juice Robinson beat um, and Dreddy and Martin last week. But still, not a storyline significant match. So I was kind of worried, like, all right, I don't know how good the show's going to be, but at least I can count on the main event of the AEW World Tag Team Championships being on the line between FTR, Adam Cole, and MJF. Being a great match, and it was. Um, they also opened the show on a high note with Andrade El Idolo facing Buddy Matthews in the ladder match for Andrade's mask. Again, a storyline kind of hard to get into, because, like, who gives a shit about Andrade's mask that he doesn't even wear during the matches? He wears it to the ring. And they never really made a big deal about it before this feud started. Um, but anyway, this ended up being quite a good show. I got there literally as the intro to the show started. So I don't know what they did beforehand. I know they taped for Ring of Honor. I don't know how many matches they taped for Ring of Honor beforehand. But let me just say this real quickly. AEW or Tony Khan, whatever the fuck, they have to do a better job of filming for Ring of Honor TV. I've been saying for months now that the formula for these Ring of Honor TV shows has been fucking terrible. It's like, they're not even like 60-minute shows. They're like 90 minutes two hours, two and a half hours of just like nothing. They're just squash matches. And there's like 10 matches, 12 matches. Some episodes had 19 fucking matches. I'm like, who is sitting down in the arena to watch this shit? And that was back when they were still taping it. I thought, I, I think at the time at Universal Studios. Now the new formula, I think, is for them to tape Rampage after Dynamite. Now was that Dynamite last week? So this is why I know this. Unless it changes from week to week. But they do Dynamite. They do a dark match before Dynamite. That doesn't air. They do a dark match, Dynamite, and then Rampage. So they don't have to tape on Fridays in addition to Saturdays. And now on Saturdays, they're doing Ring of Honor before Collision, like tape, I guess, a couple matches before the show starts at 7.30, and then a lot afterward. So they taped a few matches beforehand. Again, whatever they did, I don't know because I wasn't there in time. I did stick around for like an hour plus after Collision ended to watch some of these Ring of Honor matches. I did not stay until the end. There were still like two or three more matches I left at like fucking 11.15, 11.20. Um, the show ended at, at, the collision itself ended at 10. And a majority of the arena took off at that point. And some people stayed, more and more people left as the night went on. They never really, I don't think they announced the main event to kind of stick around for. Like with WWE, they're like, all right, the show's over, but we still have this main event to come. And that's immediately, usually right after, you know, Raw or SmackDown, it's just a dark main event. They don't fucking tape main event they don't tape 12 matches for main event, not the main event, but main event of the show that airs on Hulu every week. They don't tape that shit after Raw, because saving the stuff that people don't give a shit about until after the show doesn't make a whole lot of sense. There's no incentive for people to stay, especially when you're not advertising a main event. And it's not like Ring of Honor has the biggest stars. They had a couple good matches on the show. I won't spoil any results, but they had a good Aussie Open match. They had a good um, Ring of Honor World Women's Championship match. But beyond that, it was just a bunch of squashes, and they didn't last too long, but when you're sitting there for squash after squash after squash, after already sitting through two hours of collision, it's fucking overkill. So they gotta figure out a better way of taping this shit. They really should just shorten Ring of Honor TV and just tape the matches like they would for Darker Elevation starting at 7 p.m. Eastern Time um, before these tapings start. Start the tapings an hour later at 7 o'clock. Or 7.15, which is what they used to do with Collision and Rampage, or Collision and, or I'm sorry, Elevation and Dark. You tape six or seven matches there, you add in some promos, you're good to go. There's really no reason for these shows to be going on an hour and a half after Collision or Dynamite is over to fucking tape Ring of Honor, which at this point no one gives a shit about. There was no one, in, basically no one in the arena during that portion of the show last night. So I know that's not Collision related, but I was there and I just wanted to make that note. The actual show started, with they, the latter match between Andrade El Idolo and Buddy Matthews, Andrade's mask on the line. Really good match, as you would expect from these two. They did face off in that initial Collision show back in June. Uh, this had the ladder match stipulation. 
And it was great. The crowd was into it. They had a lot of crazy spots. I mean, I feel like I've seen enough ladder matches in wrestling, specifically WWE and um, in AEW in the last like five, ten years to last me a lifetime. But this was still very fun. <clears throat> they worked very well together. Have great chemistry. A lot of cool spots. Julie Hart was ringside for the entire match. No Brody King, no Malachi Black, no interference from them. Andrade won as you obviously, obviously expected him to. But the finish was clever where... Um, Andrade had handcuffed Buddy to the bottom rope at one point towards the end of the match. And there were also a lot of, like, uh, re or Dominic Dirty Dom chants and whatever, which is kind of funny towards Buddy Matthews. I'm sure he's sick of it at this point, but it's funny. So he gets out of the handcuffs. Julia Hart quickly gets some bolt cutters, which apparently she knew exactly where they were under the ring. She breaks the handcuffs before Andrade can win the match. They both climb up the ladder. Julia went up first because Buddy was still handcuffed at that point just to kind of keep... Um, Andrade busy and keep him distracted, whatever. And then Buddy came up after her. Andrade ended up, I think, shoving Buddy off and shoving Julia off on top of Buddy Matthews through a table that was set up at the turnbuckle. So that was kind of a cool finish. She looked like she was fine. And then Andrade won. So a good match. Uh, I, I don't know if he's going after the Ring of Honor or rather the AEW World Trios Championships. I would have to imagine he is. But they haven't really indicated that yet. Andrade's been feuding with House of Black on his own for like a month and a half now. Are they just killing time until like Roosh is ready to come back? He obviously just re-signed with the Ring of Honor, or I guess with the Ring of Honor, but also with AEW for like a, a stupid amount of money. So Roosh is sticking around. I would have to imagine Drew Listico's still there. Preston Vance. He has his pick of partners that he can choose from to face House of Black for the Trios Championships, but he just hasn't yet. So I, I don't know what the fuck is going on. Um, but hopefully at some point we get that because the Trios Championship, they were defended last week against the acclaimed of Billy Gunn. There was no follow-up on that this week, I don't think. Um, but I would think that Andrade's probably going for the Trios Championship, so otherwise this feud was just kind of a waste of time. Um, after that, they had ba -ba -ba -ba, an open challenge with Darby Allen coming out. And this was not advertised. Darby Allen was not advertised to appear on the show. But he came out randomly. Uh, it might have been during the commercial. The commercial breaks in the formatting of which during these... AEW show, specifically Collision, they have to kind of get down to a science. WWE's been doing it forever, so they kind of know what they're doing, and they're all their commercials are all over the fucking place. But, like, Darby Allen came out, and he issued an open challenge, and it was, like, several minutes before someone answered. And they didn't make it clear they weren't commercial. They didn't go to dark. They didn't start airing promos on the TV. Like, when they go to commercial, they just don't do anything. They don't really have that stuff timed down yet. So Darby Allen was just standing in the ring and people were like, what the fuck is going on? I just assumed that they were in commercial, but they didn't really make that clear. But anyway, um, he issues the open challenge, accepted by Minoru Suzuki, which was so fucking random, but it was cool. I guess when you want a surprise entrant or a surprise opponent, enter Suzuki. I thought when they did the Royal Rampage match last week, as I was there for the Rampage taping last week as well, when I, when I went to that... Um, I had figured that Suzuki was a surprise entrant in that Battle Royal because it was a cool moment. People reacted. I guess they did advertise him in the graphic. I didn't fucking see it. I could barely see the screen from where I was sitting. But apparently they did advertise Suzuki for that match. That was not supposed to be a surprise, but it kind of came off like one. But anyway, these two having a surprise impromptu match. A very good match. Cool clash of styles. Some pretty good stuff here. Allen looking good in or not even good in defeat. He actually won the match, obviously. Uh, rebounding from the loss to Swerve Strickland on Wednesday's Dynamite. Suzuki never fucking wins on his own in AEW. He's won a couple six-mans. I know he won at Forbidden Door last year with Jericho and Guevara. He won on Dynamite with Jericho and Guevara this year. I can't recall many other matches he's won in AEW beyond those. He may have won a singles match a couple of years ago. He just never fucking wins in singles matches whenever they bring him in. So his record is awful in AEW, but it's not really about that. People still like seeing him. He feels like an attraction, and he's in there for good matches. And this was fun, so I can't really complain. Samoa Joe in action after that, the Ring of Honor World Television Championship, not on the line, taking on Gravity, who we've seen a lot of lately. He was on Dynamite this week facing Pac. He beat Commander, or Commandar, whatever the hell, however the hell you pronounce his name, on uh, Death Before Dishonor, that pay-per-view last Friday. So he's been making the rounds as of late. He's also on Ring of Honor TV quite a lot. Um, he lost to Joe here in a matter of minutes, as he should have. I was not looking for a competitive match. He lost to Pac in like seven or eight minutes on Wednesday. This did not even need to be that. They need to get going with Joe here. I'm glad he's on the show. But, like, they should probably... They're probably waiting to have him break the record for longest world television championship brand in Ring of Honor history. He's been champion since, like, fucking last April. 
They need to get going here and take that belt off of him so he can really be full-time on these AEW shows. We don't know how much longer he has left in his in-ring career. Make the most of Joe while you have him. Um, he's not feuding with anyone right now. I thought we would get more from him and Punk. We're clearly not, at least not for the time being. Punk beat him, and that was it. Kind of disappointing. We never really got like a, uh, a dueling promo exchange between the two. That's kind of what I was looking forward to. Whatever. Um, but Joe beat Gravity here in a matter of minutes. The best part of the match was when Gravity was doing those dumb, and I haven't really noticed this in, in, this, in his matches previously, when he does this stupid Gravity walk like he's walking on the moon. He looks like a fucking idiot. Joe ended up running it back, and when Gravity jumped off the top rope, Joe did that thing where he walked out of the way, and he did the stupid Gravity walk to mock Gravity. That The, the crowd got a big pop out of that. That was great. And then he beat him soon after, so... Uh, this was uh, quick, painless, straight to the point. Let's get Joe in a program here. Uh, I thought someone would come out and like tease a program or whatever. No, we didn't see any of that. He just beat him and that was it. So I'm glad he was on the show. I'm glad to see Joe live, but I just would love to have seen uh, more of Joe and more, you know, promo or a feud kickoff for him. He's kind of in the Miro position right now. Miro was on the show. He got attacked backstage before he can even really say anything by fucking Aaron Solo. And then Miro... Kind of took the chair out of his hands, beat the fuck out of Aaron Solo. So I guess Miro might be feuding with QTV. I mean, come on, what the, what the fuck is this? That, that's stupid. Give Miro something more meaningful to do. Give Joe something more meaningful to do. It's not that hard. CM Punk out next for an in-ring appearance. When they said we'll hear from CM Punk, I was worried because I'm thinking they, maybe they'll just have him talk backstage. But Punk's been pretty consistent in appearing on these shows in person. He feels like the reason why a lot of these people go to these shows. Whether just it, it's to cheer him or boom or whatever. Still pretty polarizing reaction. Got a big, got a lot of cheers, and specifically from yours truly, and a lot of boos as well. It was a mixed reaction per usual for Punk. Can't tell you whether it was like 50-50 or 80-20. Felt 50-50 to me. Um, doesn't really matter, though. We spoke about what was in the bag. He took what was out of the bag. I was almost thinking for a second, is it going to be something that we're not even expecting? Because I feel like it's so obvious that it's the AEW World Championship that it's going to be something completely random. But it wasn't. It actually was the AEW World Championship that he beat John Moxley for, as he acknowledged, at All Out last year. I didn't say why the, he got the championship taken away from him. He never acknowledged that part. But he said, because I'm straight edge, I'm better than you. Taking that old line from me. He, I know he said that in Ring of Honor like 20 years ago. But when I hear that, I think of his straight edge society gimmick from the late 2000s in 2009 and 2010 in WWE when he was still doing that stuff, and it was such a great fucking gimmick. It got him so much great heat, and people booed when he said that here, and he took a can of black spray paint and then paint an X on the championship belt, coincidentally right through the E in AEW. So kind of crossing out the elite and all elite wrestling, which I thought was uh, very poetic in a way, given his issues with the Bucks in the past and the elite and whatever. So uh, th this was well done. So he was just talking about how he's the real world's champ. And then right after that, out came Ricky Starks, who came out on the stage and then wanted an entrance. So he went back, and then they played his entrance, which was great. And they kind of went back and forth, and, and, and Starks said... And Punk also said during his promo, before Starks even came out, that Star he gave Starks his props, that he beat him twice, but he did so by cheating. He beat him singles um, by cheating. And then he beat him in a tag team match last week, also by cheating. And then Starks said that here, that, listen, I beat you, Punk. I should be the world champion. And Punk said, listen, well, you... you he would be if you didn't cheat. So Punk's doing this thing where he's acting heelish in his promos, but then he goes back into babyface mode when he opposes someone who's clearly a heel in Ricky Starks. So it's weird, but I don't hate the dynamic. It is kind of confusing, but I kind of like that Shades of Grey stuff that we're getting right now with these two. It's interesting where you kind of cheer for who you want to cheer for, and I'm just digging the promo, so I'm not really complaining. But basically what this set up was a championship match, which is uh, Tony Khan sanctioned it on Twitter. <laughs> But the way he worded it, he had to word it like this. He couldn't say, oh, it's for the AEW World Championship, because it would make no fucking sense. He worded it on Twitter as what Punk is calling the real world championship. So he's just kind of saying, oh, like, Punk is calling it that, so let's call it that in the advertising. And even in the graphic, it says, for the real world championship, which is so fucking dumb. Um, I don't know how I'm going to write that in my review next week. What am I going to call it? The real world champion? I mean, come on. What the what, what does that even mean? Um... But anyway, so Starks ended up challenging him to a match. Punk accepted. It's going to happen next week, I think in Cleveland, opposite of SummerSlam. And they need a big match for that show. I mean, I'm not watching. I mean, I'll be, at I'll be at SummerSlam, so I won't be watching live. But they needed a big match for that show. And 
Starks and Punk makes sense. Um, I thought they might save it for All In, because Punk even said during his promo, like, oh, no one's really mentioned All In yet, I want to wrestle on that show. They haven't announced any matches at all for that pay-per-view, so I would fucking hope they do so soon. But they're doing it next week for the championship with a special guest referee of someone from, from Punk's past, that being Ricky the Dragon Steamboat, which is really cool. Um, so I'm glad they're doing that. But yeah, I, I can't watch live. And again, it would be one thing if they just kind of rolled over and died next week and didn't really advertise anything big, anything that fans wouldn't want to miss. It makes sense that he would want to compete with WWE and make people want to tune into Collision instead of SummerSlam. I mean, there's a lot of people who probably don't even watch WWE anyway, and they're just going to watch Collision regardless. But for the people that kind of teeter back and forth, they're probably going to want to watch SummerSlam, but they advertise this match to kind of compete with that. So I, I get it. Um, I'm bummed because it's not going to be a show I watch live. I love Collision, but I'll be at SummerSlam, obviously, so maybe I'll have it on my fucking laptop during the pay-per-view. Who the fuck knows? Uh, but that is a good match. That is a big match I'm looking forward to next week, which makes me wonder, what do they have in mind for Punk at All In? Is it a rematch with Ricky Starks? Is it a rematch with MJF for the championship? What does that mean for Adam Cole? We'll get to Cole and MJF in a minute because they were also on the show, obviously. But I'm kind of curious what this means for Punk. Does Punk and MJF happen at All In? Do we get like a situation similar to Punk and Cena from 2011 where they both hold up championship belts? I'm not exactly sure how this is going to work, but I'm very curious to see what they do. Uh, Bullet Club Gold, represented by Juice Robinson and the Guns, taking on and beating the trio of the AAA Mega Champion El Ijo Del Vikingo, Darius Martin in action, and Dreddy. Um, fun little match here. They had a, I mean, listen, I don't give a fuck about the Guns or Juice Robinson, really. But this was a good match. It was well-wrestled, as you would expect. The best part of the match... And I thought this was funny that they acknowledged it and like went back to it and shit. Was the Jay White standee at ringside? They carried it around. They would do like the gun pose to it. Jay White wasn't there, so they just had a standee of Jay White in their corner, which was pretty fucking funny. Um, this was a good match, though. It gives Bullet Club Gold another win, coming off their loss to FDR two weeks ago. Mercedes Martinez in action against Kier Hogan. Such a random match. Again, like no storyline support, not even announced until like they announced it on social media yesterday or the day before. So fucking random. Um, the weird thing though, it was a good match and I'm glad they gave them a couple minutes. I don't know if it went through a commercial break. Again, I was there live. I don't know. What was weird about this though, was the fact that Mercedes Martinez is a Connecticut native. So people obviously cheered her when they announced her from Brass City CT and it didn't really come across like she was a heel during the match. It kind of felt like just a regular match. Kira Hogan was clearly a baby face, but I'm thinking, okay, that doesn't even really matter. It didn't really stick out to me that Martinez was supposed to be the heel until she started attacking Hogan afterward. So I just thought it was weird, like, why would you bring back Martinez in her hometown if she's supposed to be the fucking heel? Like, they didn't really give anyone a reason to boo her until afterward, and the people were just kind of confused. And then they booed Statlander, because Martinez was the CT native. So, very strange. But again, all of this led to Martinez um, laying out Statlander with the TBS championship belt, and then Willow Nightingale making the save. So they set up a couple different matches here with Martinez challenging maybe Nightingale first and then Statlander, maybe the other way around. And it's going to be Martinez and Chris Statlander at some point for the TBS Championship, which is good. I mean, I'm not sure anyone that really cares about the TBS Championship right now. It's just barely on these shows, and when it is, it's just a random open challenge from Statlander. It's not really a feud. They did do the feud stuff with uh, Taya Valkyrie, but that lasted a month, and they haven't really done anything with that championship since. Um... I mean, this was an attempt. I mean, it's better than nothing. So, I mean, they really do need to book their women's division better. That sign kind of hit the nail right on the head on Wednesday's Dynamite during the Taya and Britt Baker match. But, you know, this was uh, still a good match, and at least it set something up, and it wasn't just a random. It, it was a random match, but it ended up making sense when it was, once it was over. Uh, we get to the main event just like that. The, the night just flew by for the AW World Tag Team Championships, FTR, defending against MJF and Adam Cole, the world champion MJF, that is. Uh, tremendous match. The crowd was super into MJF and Cole. They got a mega reaction. FDR were booed pretty heavily here by a majority of the crowd. Despite being the most over guys in the building a couple of weeks ago, they were booed here because they love MJF and Cole so much. They were automatically, by default, the heels in this match. Um, you honestly did not know for a fact that MJF and Cole were losing. I thought there was a chance they could possibly take the titles, extend this out, give the belts back to FTR, give, the, give them the belts back at another point. They didn't do that. They kept the belts on them here, which was a uh, not a surprising finish, but kind of deflating for some people that really wanted MJF and Cole to win. Even more surprising was the fact that they pinned MJF, actually. They pinned MJF, but 
I'm not entirely upset at that because what happened here was Cole was about to take the big rig, I think, or the chatter machine or, or whatever they're calling it now. I think they've called it chatter machine in recent weeks. I'm not sure if they're going back to it. I'm, I'm not sure. But FTR ended up hitting it on MJF instead when MJF sacrificed himself and pushed Cole out of the way. So that's why MJF got pinned. So I would not pin MJF in a random, and it wasn't a random tag team match, but if it's not leading to Dax Harwood and MJF for the World Championship, which I guess it could be on a random collision coming up, then I'm kind of like, eh, you know, I wouldn't do that. But listen, it was a part of the storyline. He, sacri he sacrificed himself for Cole, and they were able to coexist. I saw someone say on, on Twitter, or X, I guess, last night, whatever the fuck, um, the AEW did a can they coexist storyline with these two on this show, and the answer was yes, they could. The answer was no on SmackDown with Bianca and uh, Charlotte. The answer here was yes, that MGF and Cole were able to coexist, and they lost, but they didn't turn on each other. Cole did not turn on him. MGF did not turn on him, and that was how the show ended. So, uh, you know, we were left wondering what was next. Will MGF remain a babyface? He lost the match, but he didn't turn on Cole. Maybe he's playing the long game. No Roderick Strong. He didn't pop up here. I heard Richard Holiday was backstage. He has history with MJF as part of the Dynasty and MLW. I thought maybe he might pop up and ha and help MJF turn on Cole or help him like lose. I don't know something, and that didn't happen either. But I guess we'll see. I am very curious to see where they go from here. It's the best part of AEW right now by a wide margin, and they work so well together that maybe not having them turn on their, on each other quite yet is the right way to go. Maybe they do a segment on Dynamite next week where it's like. Um, you know, maybe they address what their future is. And MJF always said, he did say on Wednesday, win, win, lose, or draw here, that he will give Cole another shot of the AEW World Championship without Cole even asking for it. So that's still to come. Maybe they'll do it both as baby faces. I'm not sure. But that looks to be the direction they're headed in, which is cool. Um, after the show, in addition to taping Ring of Honor, but they taped like an extra 10 minutes. They just want an extra 10 minutes with Cole and MJF addressing the audience, purely in baby face mode. Uh, bringing back out FTR, giving them their props, and then they all share tequila and the in, the, in MJF's words, world famous Connecticut pizza. We never found out where it was from. They didn't plug where it was from. I would have loved to have known. Um, they, they do have pretty great pizza here in Connecticut. I won't complain. And um, yeah, that was how they kind of went off the air and went back on the air. Or however, they fucking you know followed it up with the live crowd after the show went off the air. And then in addition to the Ring of Honor tapings that I already mentioned earlier. So, great show. I really enjoyed this collision. I've been really digging collision um, the last month and a half since it started. But being there live for it for the first time, my thoughts have not changed. I think they need to, need to do a better job of, like, again, stick around for this post-show match match or post -show matchup, which they didn't do. They just kind of were, like, switching it up to Ring of Honor, maybe expecting people to care. Aside from Tony Khan, I'm not really sure who, I'm not really sure who did care. Um, they had probably 20% of the audience, 25 max, 25% of the audience stick around for Ring of Honor. It just looked fucking awful. I'm not sure why they would do that. Um, they need to do a better job of like, they don't need to say this is a commercial, but like the formatting of some of these shows, like with the Darby Allen thing, it's like, okay, he issued an open challenge and there's no indication that the show isn't off the air. So why the fuck is it taking 20 minutes for someone to answer the open challenge? Aside from stuff like that, it was, uh, and, and some of the sound was weird too in the arena. Um, it was a great time, and uh, they, they got something special with Collision right now. I would not ruin this momentum for anything. Keep delivering strong shows. It's got a much simpler layout than Dynamite. It did feel a little bit Dynamite-ish, like some of the random matches, like Joe and Gravity, Martinez and Hogan. They didn't really advertise that stuff. It felt like Dynamite in that way, but I still, I still very much enjoyed the show, and I thought it was better than, again, all the shows this week. I enjoyed this more than, I mean, I was there live, so I'm biased, but... I enjoyed this more than Raw, Dynamite, SmackDown, all the shows. I thought this was a very fun two-hour program that left me looking forward to next week with uh, Starks and Punk advertising a big match with Ricky the Dragon Steamboat as the special guest referee. Unfortunately, can't watch live opposite of SummerSlam, so I'll catch up when I can either later that night, uh, probably the next day at some point when I'm on my, when I'm on my flight back home. But uh, we'll see. I'm looking forward to that match next week on Collision, and we'll... Try to have an on-site report. There might not be an on-site report. Not an on I won't be there, obviously. But an audio review for Collision next week. Again, I will be traveling, so probably not. Because I might not be back until late next Sunday. So if I am, there probably won't be a Collision review. So just keep an ear and eye out for that, whatever. And that'll likely we'll take a week off from that next week, and we'll be back to it the week later. Uh, thank you guys so much for checking out my on-site report, my audio review from Collision last night in Hartford. Had a great time. Be sure to like the video, drop a comment, share the video, and subscribe to the channel for more daily content. 
And uh, we'll be back soon here on the channel with more content, including a dark side of the ring review coming up a little bit later today on the Bam Bam ba on the Bam Bam Bigelow episode rather from earlier this week. So keep an eye out for that uh, coming up on the feed a little bit later on today. Again, guys, enjoy the rest of your weekend. I'm Graham Jesus and Matthews, and I'll catch your ass down the road.